Okay, so this is lecture 17 uh, in CE 241, uh, and this is going to be the first of two lectures uh, where we discuss uh, some uh, broad applications of surveying, particularly in the realm of mapping. Uh, so uh, just to you know put things in context, so um, for the first um, um, part of the semester, what we've been learning is what I would call measuring techniques. Um, so things like how to run an auto level, how to run a total station, and then with those techniques, learning how to do things like a differential leveling loop, uh, like a traverse, uh, as an example. And so those are about taking measurements and correcting them and classifying uh, their quality uh, and et cetera. But there needs to be a purpose of those measurements at the end of the day. And so I would say that the um, starting now, uh, throughout the, the remainder of the semester, we're going to kind of get into that realm where we're, we're um, taking those techniques and applying them to specific problems uh, in the land of, uh, of civil engineering and surveying. And so our first set of lectures are going to be discussing mapping applications, uh, uh, preparing maps. Um, and um, while you know we can get into the weeds on the, the specific types of jobs that land surveyors um, uh, do, um, I would say that those mapping applications probably fall into um, maybe what I would say two or three categories. Um, the first being uh, what we're going to discuss today, which are property surveys or boundary surveys. Um, and then the next uh, will be things like topography um, uh, that are ultimately used for things like flood certifications or things like that, or construction. Um, and construction is going to be a, a big sort of both direct and indirect topic of what we're going to be doing for the, the remainder of the semester. So uh, in latter lectures, we'll discuss things like horizontal curves and vertical curves and earthwork calculations. Um, and, and those would be applications of the, um, the work that, that we've done so far. Uh, but to begin, uh, what we're going to do today is discuss property surveys. Um, and so uh, first off, I want to um, go through and talk about what it is that we're talking about. So we're talking about taking property and describing them legally, um, talking about the requirements, the field procedures. And so just to, as a disclaimer, I'm I might use the term property survey and boundary survey a, a bit interchangeably, but I'm essentially talking about the, the same thing. Um, and so what do I mean by a property survey? Um, and so what I'm talking about is, so let's say we have a piece of property. So we'll look at uh, this, this image here uh, on the right for, um, for reference. Um, a property survey is intended to uh, assist in the establishment of the boundaries of that property. Um, when you purchase a piece of property or when somebody owns a piece of property, that property is defined uh, as it existing within a, a given defined region. And so, for example, if we look at this property, so this would be a property uh, that contains a small brick house. You can see a garage in the, uh, the back corner of the lot. And so you can see this is uh, a property that would be defined by, we'll say, four property corners um, and four courses. We can see that, you know, one of those courses um, uh, 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 is right on the edge of Walnut Avenue, and we can see the property owners on, on either side. Um, this is uh, essentially what you're purchasing. When you say you purchase a piece of land, well, what does that mean? Um, you're purchasing a piece of land defined by, by this geometry, defined by, by this description. Um, and so the, the, um, when we're talking about property in the field, the property lines are often uh, monumented um, at the points where they intersect are what I'll call the property corners. So for example, if we look at this property, it's, there's property A, B, C, and D. Um, at those points, there is typically some type of monument. Um, usually the land surveyor will either uh, first try and discover monuments that are already present, or if there are monuments that are gone, lost to, to time or whatnot, they will then set new property uh, uh, corners. Um, so what are we trying to do in the realm of boundary surveying? We're trying to determine the lengths of the boundary lines, the direction of the boundary lines, and the exact position of those uh, property corners. That's, that's our, our purpose uh, uh, with this application. Um, I guess one question to ask is why would you need to do that? Um, you know, for example, you know, here we are in Huntington, West Virginia, um, or in Cabell County. Maybe I'll, I'll use Cabell County to, to explain. Um, Property definitions, you would think, are pretty well defined. The country's been in existence for, for you know, over 200 years. Why would we need to do surveys if all the properties are, are split up? Well, um, usually what we're trying to do uh, in the land of boundary surveying is uh, we're usually trying to resurvey 
um, to locate and, and, and reestablish boundaries. Um, yet one of the things you have to keep in mind is that, you know, just because of, you know, the, the, the age of a given region, you know, again, like I said, country's been around for a very long time, it's not as if all of the properties were surveyed all at the same time. Surveys are happening at all sorts of different uh, times throughout history. So if you're a, um, uh, an individual, let's say, trying to purchase a piece of property and, you know, you're, you're trying to get, let's say, a loan on that property, um, you pull, let's say, the, the property description and it was based on a survey that was conducted in the 1950s or the 1960s. That's not uncommon. Um, and you have to understand that, that you know, back in the day, we didn't have uh, electronic distance measuring devices like we do now. We don't have, we didn't have total stations or GPSs or things like that. Um, it, it's not that uncommon that even to this day, you will find uh, uh, surveys with property descriptions that are, or properties with property descriptions that are based on some really uh, um, more classical methods. Now, I have here an image in this slide of what's called a Gunter's chain. We haven't talked about different uh, uh, units of measurement in, uh, in this class beyond, you know, typical, you know, feet and meters and things like that. But um, back in the day, so um, one of the, um, the more common means of, of distance measuring device, of uh, distance measurement, was to use a device called a Gunter's chain. Um, this was an older device. Uh, it uh, consisted of 100 lengths, and the total length of the Gunter's chain was, was 66 feet. This was used, you know, for, for a very long time to, to uh, assist in mapping the United States. Um, and it essentially consisted of pulling a chain up a hill and using that to, to measure distances. And back, back in the day, that, that's, that's all surveyors had. Well, when you compare that to the accuracy of the devices that we, we have today, it doesn't hold a candle. So you'll, it's not that uncommon that somebody will um, uh, be in the uh, process of purchasing a land and the lending agency might say, we need an updated property description. We need a, a more accurate survey in order to, to value this land. And that's where the land surveyor comes in. Um, so that's uh, uh, what I mean when I say resurvey. Um, and so ultimately what you're trying to do is prepare an updated uh, what I would call legal description uh, of the, the tract of land or the parcel. Um, it's also not uh, uncommon for a land surveyor to be um, uh, asked to subdivide a parcel into smaller lots um, and delineate you know, where rights of way and things like that are. So for example, you might have somebody who purchased 30, 40 acres of land and wants to turn it into a subdivision. So the surveyor will come in and set corners for the various lots and then where the streets will go uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, and, and I would say that, that um, uh, th this is a field where it's, it's, it's probably very easy to find uh, uh, work, especially uh, in areas with a lot of real estate transactions because there's always uh, going to be a pressing need for, uh, for land surveyors uh, in these uh, uh, areas. Now I've mentioned the term, um, uh, property descriptions and legal descriptions. What do I mean by that? So um, first, to make sure that we're on uh, uh, the same page, um, what we're ultimately trying to get to is the definition of the, the property deed. Okay, So a deed is just a document, a legal document, that um, officially describes a piece of property and the deed's purpose is to transfer ownership of that property from one person to another, um, among other things. But that's kind of the, the main gist of it. Um, at least for our purposes as engineers and surveyors, it's really, for the most part, what we need to know. Um, the idea is that when you identify the property, it needs to be clear and it needs to not be subject to varying interpretations. And so there's specific language and a specific uh, way that a, a description of a property is written so that it's very clear and unambiguous. Um, now, different regions of the country, different states will have different requirements on how deeds should be written and what methods that you should use to describe a property. So to give you an example, um, some states will want properties to be described by coordinates. So you start at this coordinate, go to uh, 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 from one coordinate to another coordinate, and then that is a, um, a property line, and then you'll go from coordinates to coordinates. And, and I'm using the term coordinates a bit fast and loose because I'm going to talk about that here in a bit. Um, but I would say the most common uh, means of describing properties is using what's called meets and bounds or, or, or meets and bounds descriptions. And so the way that a meets and bounds description works is you start off by defining a point of beginning uh, for the lot. 
Um, and then what it'll do is from that point of beginning, define bearing and distance to the next point, bearing and distance to the next point, bearing and distance to the next point. You keep going until you um, close. Um, and one thing I'll mention, you do typically use bearings, not azimuths, to uh, um, describe properties. Uh, I would say that um, sometimes, dependent upon where you're at, uh, bearings are referencing north. And so maybe the, the variation of north or what's assumed north can be a bit problematic. Um, I know in my practice, you know, when you know, I used to work at a, a land surveying firm when I was uh, doing my undergraduate degree, and very anxious in north never really became a very big problem. But um, I guess if you have a really large survey, uh, depending upon how you define north, that could be um, that could be a little troubling. Um, ultimately, the the um, land surveyor will pr uh, provide at the end of the day. Uh, not just you know an establishment of where the property or where their opinion of the property corners are, and I'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, but also a meets and bounds description, and then a drawing of the property. Now, in uh, surveying lingo, the the term that we use for a drawing of a piece of property is called a plat, a P L A T. Um, so if you hear me use the term plat, I'm just talking about the uh, description of, of a of a property. Um, but the um, uh, usually it's typical you provide that drawing, but the written legal description is what's always incorporated incorporated into the deed, and usually that plat uh, is referenced. Um, to give you kind of an idea how a meets and bounds description works, I'm going to go through a couple of examples. This example is maybe a bit more realistic on the legal side, but maybe not so much on the math side. So I have two examples on that. So let's look at this lot. Um, so it's in metric, but that's not going to be a really big deal for our, our legal description. So we have lot one. Um, so we're talking about this shaded lot here. Uh, it's located on Adam Road, uh, along Adam Road. Um, and let's talk about the property corners. So we have, and, and this legal description is, is kind of nice because we've got different property corners. So we have a concrete monument, an iron pipe. We have a wooden stake. Nobody would really set a wooden stake as a new property corner, and, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but no, nobody would ever really do that. Um, uh, 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 these days there are standards for what you can use for, for property corners. Um, but we've got different property corners and that'll help um, guide our, uh, uh, our navigation of the description. Um, uh, other thing I want you to note is this term POB. So uh, let me turn my laser pointer on. So POB uh, right here stands for point of beginning. And so that's where the legal description is going to begin. Uh, and then we're going to navigate around the property um, uh, describing the bearings and distances until we get back to the point of beginning. Uh, and the other thing I want you to note is the owners of the adjacent lot. So we have an L&T Duncan who owns this lot to the west. Um, SNS Franks, who owns the lot to the north, and SNF Hershey, who owns the lot to the east. You'll see that pop up here in a second. Okay, so here would be the description. Um, uh, now, first thing to note is I've got the description listed in bullets. You would never do that in an actual legal description. It would all just be one paragraph, but I'm breaking it up into bullets here on the slide, so it's a little bit easier to digest. So the first part of the legal description talks about the beginning, so I'm going to read this out. Beginning at a point on the north side of Adam Road, 160 meters due west from a concrete monument uh, at the corner formed by the intersection of the north side of Adam Road and the west side of Ginger Lane. Okay, there's a lot to, to unpack there. But what we're talking about, so let's take that one step at a time. So we're beginning at this point, okay? Where is that point? It's on the north side of Adam Road. So here's Adam Road. We're on the north side of it. And this point is actually not defined by a physical monument itself. It's, it's referencing, it's being referenced by another physical monument. So we have a, this concrete monument here. This concrete monument's on the north side of Adam Road, the west side of Ginger Lane. And if you take this monument and you go 160 meters due west from that monument here, you will get to the point of beginning. So that point of beginning uh, is not referenced by that um, uh, 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 by that monument, and, or that, that point of beginning doesn't have a monument, it's using another monument as reference. But if you take that um, description and that first bullet and sort of digest it, really what it's doing is it's helping you locate the point of beginning, but also, um, maybe not more importantly, but just as important, it's describing, a, uh, um, uh, it, it's describing that point of beginning in a way that's unambiguous. We know that we're on the north side of Adam Road. We know we're starting at this monument that's at the intersection of this road and Ginger Lane. So the idea is that if all you had was just that sentence, that first component of the meets and bounds description, 
the idea is you could go to Adam Road and Ginger Lane and find that point. That's that's kind of the, the purpose of this description. And then from there, and it, it, you know, we're, it, it, I guess the term is legalese, we're getting, we're seeing vents 30 meters due west, vents 60 meters, so you can kind of see that, um, that, that lingo there. So from this point of beginning, we'll go vents 30 meters due west along the north side of Adam Road. Um, I actually should have put here uh, to a concrete monument. Let me actually, let me uh, include that. Let's put do that because that would actually be more accurate so maybe what we'll do is we'll do that let's do that okay so we'll say from the point of beginning uh 30 meters due west to the north uh, along the north side of adam road to a concrete monument then we'll say thence 60 meters north um along the line now or formerly of l t duncan so we're going along this line to an iron pipe, so we can see the iron pipe referenced in the description, thence 30 meters due east uh, uh, along the line now or formally of SNS Frank. So one of the reasons it's saying now or formally is because you're writing the description um, as, like the description is as of the, the time that you did the survey. Well, five years from now, those adjacent lots might be purchased by somebody else. So that's why it says now or formally. Um, thence, uh, that, so at this wooden stake, thence, uh, 60 meters due south uh, along the line now or formerly of SNF Hershey to the point of beginning. Okay, so the idea is that it would go from the very beginning around like a traverse back to the point of beginning. Um, and it does contain, um, the, this lot contains 1,800 square meters. This one's pretty easy because it's 30 meters by 60 meters and it's a rectangle, so 30 times 60 is 1,800. We can calculate that area very, very easily. Again, I keep mentioning this, but we are gonna discuss uh, some algorithms to compute area of these irregular polygons and they're a lot easier, it's a lot easier than you would think. Um, okay, so this would be a legal description of this property. I wanna show you another legal description. So this is a legal description of the in-class example that we did for our four-point traverse. Um, we had taken the survey data and done all of the adjustments to get the survey closed. So the angular adjustment, or the, the adjustments for angular misclosure and for linear misclosure. And we ultimately ended up with these azimuths and these lengths. Now, for the purposes of the meets and bounds description, I've taken the azimuths and converted them to bearings. By now, that should be pretty easy for everybody. So for example, segment AB, the azimuth was 193, 55, 57. That's a southwest bearing. And so you just take the azimuth minus 180 and get your bearing. So I've just done that for the remainder of the, uh, the points in the traverse. Um, if I wanted to do a legal description of that, so um, one thing I'll mention is that the legal description here is pretty bare because uh, I'm just looking at this from a... Um, uh, from a math perspective, so I'm just showing the, for example, thence south uh, 13, 55, 57, 636.41 feet to point B, then I'm going to point C to point D. I'm just showing the the um, legal description with a little bit more specificity in the bearings and distances. But when we were doing this uh, example, we weren't talking about point B being an iron pipe. We weren't talk talking about course AB being along Smith Street or something. We, we just were looking at a traverse and doing the math. So without an understanding of the adjacent properties or rights of way or monuments, you know, whatever we're using for corners, the legal description is somewhat bare. I'm, I mentioned that part because if you're using software packages like say AutoCAD Civil 3D, um, usually those packages have routines where it will generate legal descriptions for you. Um, I actually generated this legal description using AutoCAD Civil 3D, but because I'm just drawing the, um, uh, uh, the, the polygon traverse and then having it generate a legal description without that um, contextual information, it comes out pretty bare. So I just throw that out there for, um, for, for, your, um, for your understanding. Um, I did also compute the area. It's about 6.26 acres, um, uh, but you'll see how we... Um, uh, um, you'll see again later uh, how we can compute that. So I just wanted to give you a couple examples of a meets and bounds description. So if you're ever, you know, for example, if any of you have uh, friends or siblings or parents that own land and they have a copy of their deed and um, would let you look at it, take a look at it because you'll probably see a description that looks something like this and now you'll kind of see where all that's coming from. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the what actually the role of the land surveyor is. Um, and so 
if you are uh, performing land surveying, I would say that the the two biggest um, roles of a land surveyor these days are either in the realm of boundary surveying um, or in construction. Those would be the two biggest um, uh, air, uh, chief um, uh, um, uh, markets that a, that a land surveyor would would um, would serve. And if you're in, if we're talking about boundary surveys, land, uh, there's oftentimes we have land disputes um, between adjacent property owners or, or what have you. And the land surveyor's job uh, usually comes in to help resolve that dispute. But one thing to be clear is that uh, what a surveyor does is they provide an opinion, an expert opinion, but an opinion about where the property line goes. They're not the ones that are actually establishing the property line. Now, to, to be clear, as a land surveyor, you should be um, providing the um, location of that property line to the best of your ability um, to, to, to as true the location as possible. Um, but ultimately, whenever you have a, uh, a boundary dispute, the line can only be legally fixed really one of two ways. It's either, so if you have two adjacent landowners that, are, that have a disagreement about where the line of the property uh, is, um, the, really the only way it can be resolved is if the two uh, a, a disputing landowners can come to a mutual agreement, which is, happens, that's, that's, that's obviously a, a, a very common thing, or it goes to court. And ultimately, it is the uh, judge's decision to actually call the ball on where the property line is. Now, they will obviously take the opinion of a, uh, a land surveyor into strong account, but again, it's ultimately the... Um, the, the judge's decision to, to set that boundary. Um, now, one thing I, I mentioned uh, is that surveyors, uh, by default, should assume they have no legal authority to enter private property to survey. There are some states that have provisions that, that allow land, licensed land surveyors to enter a, a piece of property for that um, uh, for the purposes of land surveying. And dependent upon where you are, I'm, I'm not trying to give you know legal advice on the video, but I would just make sure that you know you, you reference you know, uh, 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 local legal um, requirements to, to uh, in ensure you know what your authority is. But um, as, a, um, as a rule, you should probably assume that you don't have uh, um, uh, uh, legal authority to enter private property. I know uh, anytime that, that I did um, uh, land surveying, we tried our best to restrict our, um, our, our um, uh, presence to either public right of way or the piece of property uh, owned by our client who, who actually hired us to, to, to do the survey. And for the most part, you know, you're able to, to, to do that. Um, but it's just, just uh, make sure that's worth mentioning. And one thing I also mentioned, is the, the surveyors can be held liable for any damage uh, that they do uh, to the property. Um, so, uh, for example, if you have um, uh, property corners that are buried, you know, you might have to... Um, dig in order to fi actually find the property corners, well, you, you know, like you'd be responsible for any damages. We actually had sort of a technique when, um, when I was, uh, 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 when I was doing this where we would sort of dig out sort of a small, like, I guess what we would call plug of grass. So we would lift that out, locate the property corner, and then we could put that back and then it would grow back and it, it wouldn't be disturbed. And so we, we made it a point to respect the, um, uh, the, the, the property that, that we were on. Um, uh, there, there is uh, uh, usually a statute of limitations, and it usually begins. Um, not only can you, can you have uh, uh, um, liability due to damages, but there's also liability that the surveyor has for mistakes or omissions or inaccurate work. And usually, the statute of limitations begins from the time the error is discovered, not when the time the work was done. So it's not uncommon for surveyors to carry insurance, um, similar to physicians carrying malpractice insurance and uh, things like that. So it's just just um, throwing that out there to you. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, you know, surveyors are doing a, a lot of resurveys. So what, what's that process? What, what does a resurvey entail? Um, so the first thing to do, so if somebody, uh, if you get a phone call and somebody wants to hire you to survey a tract of land, um, the first thing that you would do is collect as much data as you can about that tract of land. So um, what that means is you can go to, let's say, your county tax map, find the um, reference to that parcel. So you'll typically try and find reference to that parcel and at least all of the parcels surrounding it. Um, maybe if we're talking about a survey that's been from, 
a very long time ago. Maybe you'll also get some some boundary surveys around that. You want to try and collect as much information as possible so you have uh, reference and control for when you actually go and do your field work. Um, ultimately, what you need are descriptions of the, the property and adjacent properties around that. And you find the deeds of those adjoining properties from the courthouse. So you'll go to the courthouse, go to where the deeds are stored, and you can look up deeds um, for the um, uh, you can look up deeds for the uh, uh, for the properties uh, uh, surrounding it. So the, usually the the way that works is you'll go to the tax map and find the the parcels that you're 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 referencing, and the tax map will reference um, that if you want to find the deed for this parcel, it's in deed book. 386 starting on page 294 uh, and you'll go into the deed room and there'll be you know hundreds literally hundreds of deed books and you just go to that deed book go to that page number and, and find the um, uh, the deed reference um, so you know again the first thing to do is just get all of that data get all that reference before you go out to the field and go out to the site you go to the site and the first thing you'll try and do is try and search for existing corner markers so um, for example, if there are um, iron pens or iron pipes that were, were uh, pre uh, previously used as property corners, then we will um, try and find those corners, often with a metal detector to try and uh, locate where they are. Um, and then what we'll do is do a field uh, survey, um, do a traverse to try and um, uh, precisely locate those corners, and maybe we'll need to tie into uh, adjacent property corners uh, as well. Um, and uh, Ultimately, our final goal at the end of the day is to prepare a plat and description of the parcel uh, and to monument the property corners. Now, it's not uncommon that um, sometimes you'll find property corners don't exist. Um, for example, you, you might find property corners that are um, uh, uh, you know, from an older deed that reference an old tree up, uh, uh, on top of a hill. That, that's more common than you would think for much older property descriptions. Well, over time, that tree is gone. Uh, maybe the tree died, maybe, you know, taken down, who knows. And so you know where the point is, but there's nothing there to monument it. So the surveyor will place a monument to, to indicate that property corner. The state, um, so wh where you're operating, the state will have specific standards on what is allowed to be a property corner. And in the state of West Virginia, there's a couple of different options, but by far the most common is to use a piece of rebar. Um, and so you'll the, the, the standard in West Virginia is to use a number five bar that's at least 30 inches long. Sometimes if you have a little bit loose soil, you'll use a longer piece of rebar to ensure that that property corner uh, is stable. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll place the property corner um, where the uh, uh, where it should be, and we're actually going to have a, a lab later with horizontal horizontal curves where we're actually going to be doing stakeouts uh, in the field to stake out a, a horizontal curve. But um, you'll place a, a, a number five rebar, and then you'll have a uh, this plastic ID cap that goes on top of it. So I've got this image here on top where you can kind of see one that's set. Um, and usually what that plastic ID cap will have on top of it is the the name of the surveyor or the company. So it, it you know if it was ABC surveying, it might say ABC surveying or it might say if the surveyor is Jane Smith, it might say Smith. Uh, and then the next line will have the license number. So it might be Smith, West Virginia, PS1234, whatever the, the, the license number is, so that you know who, who placed that uh, survey monument. But yeah, number five rebar and um, uh, with uh, number five capped rebar is the most common conventional standard uh, in West Virginia because you know you can place that pretty easily and then identify it by the uh, surveyor, surveyor who, who uh, installed the monument. Um, couple things worth mentioning. So like I said, we do, we typically do a traverse around the property. Um, a couple things uh, regarding that. Um, sometimes you might have uh, a traverse that you need to do where you have obstructions. And so what you might do is actually, so for example, you might have, um, let's say you had a property like this where the property corners are indicated by these PC um, uh, uh, these PC points, but you can't actually get to them or it's difficult to set up there. So you might actually perform your traverse a little bit away from them and then do side shots to locate those property corners, which is, again, as long as you're providing a means of correcting your, your data, that, that, that that's fine. You just need to ensure that you're meeting uh, um, closure requirements and whatnot. Um, but it's also uh, not uncommon to maybe do um, 
what I would call a radial traverse. So maybe, for example, if you're setting up trying to locate a house, you might set up here, uh, do your back sight, but then also shoot, um, you know, uh, to, to get corners of the house and, and property corners uh, and things like that. So we'll call those side shots. Um, just a little bit of real world that you might have to set up away from your property corners because of uh, obstructions and things like that. Um, in addition to the description in the survey, you have to prepare a plat. Um, uh, standards can vary a little bit from state to state in terms of what goes on that plat, but in general, the um, plat or the drawing of the property that you generate has to include a title block, um, uh, spe some specific property information, so things like um, maybe the deed book and page number or the tax map and parcel number, so that, again, it, it's an, uh, a non-ambiguous um, non reference to the lot uh, in question. Uh, you will need to provide the, the surveyor's name and their seal and license number goes on the drawing. Um, North Arrow drawing scale, the point of beginning, uh, as will be described in the property description, uh, every one of the property lines will have bearings and distances on them. So typically you'll have the line and you'll maybe put the bearing on one side, the distance on the other. Um, you'll want to include what the property corner markers are. And so usually you'll find an abbreviation for here's a property corner and either found or set. So found being you, you discovered that um, property corner in the field, set being you installed that, that property corner, that monument to, to indicate that, that point. Um, any existing buildings, fences, um, usually you'll find easements, utilities, water meters, things like that, the area of the parcel, um, etc. Um, I'm actually going to um, pull up West Virginia minimum standards. Give me one second. All right, so um, I've got here the um, uh, West Virginia minimum standards for surveys. I've uploaded this to Blackboard as well. Um, these are the standards to establish criteria for um, how surveys should be conducted, and usually every state's going to have something similar to this. Um, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, so, for example, if we look at minimum standards for boundary surveys, um, it um, goes through and um, uh, delineates what a surveyor is should be doing in terms of, you know, what they need to do for record search, um, what they need to do for communication, what they need to do for the field survey. So, for example, if you look at um, the monument uh, uh, descriptions, this is in 7.3e, so um, what can we use for monuments? So set monuments. Set monuments shall be durable, reasonably stable, and firmly placed. Um, we have a couple options. We have iron or steel pipes. We have rebar um, with a minimum outside diameter of 5 eighths. So 5 eighths rebar is number five. Number five rebar with a minimum length of 30 inches. Um, there's other descriptions for other markers. But again, uh, in, in West Virginia, I'd say the most um, common property marker is that, the number five rebar, with, uh, and usually with a identification on it, or identification cap on it. The plat, um, you can see here's the plat, and then we have the north arrow, the outlined area, the name and location, measured length, and so on and so forth. It goes through and indicates everything that a survey plat must have in order to meet West Virginia minimum survey standards. In fact, when we were generating plats uh, in our office, I mean, we literally had this on the wall um, whenever we were drawing, and whenever we produced a... Um, uh, whenever we produced a drawing, you know, that it was like the first thing that we did to check is make sure that we checked off all these boxes that it met the standard and then go into a more uh, thorough review to make sure everything uh, was correct. But it was at a minimum, we had to make sure we, we met that. Um, so uh, I have that on the uh, on Blackboard. You should take a look at it. Um, I believe one of the homework six questions, I think one of them references that. So it, it would be worth uh, taking a look at. Okay, um, I want to close this video by talking a little bit about referencing property data. So um, the first thing I want to mention are state plan coordinates, and then we'll get into the U.S. Uh, public land survey system. Um, so I've mentioned state plan coordinates before in lab. Um, I want to talk about what those are. So each state will have a um, system of rectangular coordinates that's been established by the National Geodetic Society. So as we mentioned before, um, for the most part as surveyors, we try and uh, perform all of our surveys assuming a plane surface. Um, that's not um, all the time possible, 
um, if we're doing really, really large surveys, but for the most part, um, if we're with, with the scale of applications we're doing, we can sort of like ignore the curvature of the earth. Well, that's usually not all that possible if you're um, looking at a coordinate system for an entire state. You probably need to split that up into various zones. And so each, each state is gonna have a system of these zones um, that are sort of assumed to uh, act as a, a, a planar coordinate system, and we call those state plane coordinates. Um, state plane coordinates are widely used uh, as uh, references for initiating surveys. Um, you'll also find them in, in construction, property de, uh, um, boundary determination, etc. cetera. Um, with all surf systems, we need a reference datum. Our current reference datum is what we call NAD83, the North American datum of 1983. So I mentioned that just if you're ever using any GPS software, and we're actually going to try and use a GPS. Um, uh, uh, we're going to try and do a GPS lab a little later in the semester. When we start tying into coordinates, you have to choose your datum, and our current one is NAD83. So you'll you'll see that in our options. Um, States will usually have anywhere between one and six zones, depending upon the size. Um, so we're talking about a coordinate system. Uh, one of the first questions you want to ask with a coordinate system is where is the origin? Okay. Well, usually what will happen is with every zone, you establish the origin of the coordinate system by going some distance uh, west of the central meridian, so something about like two million feet. Uh, and some distance south of the zone's southernmost point. So for example, if here's the zone, uh, I'm gonna try and do this backwards. So we're gonna go some distance south of the southernmost point and some distance west. So on the camera, this should be west for you. So some distance south and some distance west. And so the origin is like right here, okay? So here's the region and the origin is right here. So if you want to go to a point in that region, you go some distance east and some distance north. So that's why coordinates, it, 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 we haven't really talked about this, but that's why coordinates for um, traverses, we call the coordinates northings and eastings because the origin is usually set some distance southwest of the zone. So that, and, and the reason we do that is so that all the coordinates are positive. You, you know, that, that ensures they're all positive. And uh, the idea again is that we go um, some distance east and some distance north to a given point in question. That's why the x distances are called east, eastings and the y distances are called northings. This is a view of the state plane coordinates uh, in the United States. West Virginia has two uh, zones. So we are currently in West Virginia South. Um, and I put a link here to a little tool that we can use to do some conversions. So I'm actually gonna pull this tool up. Um, let's pull this tool up right here. So this is a uh, coordinate transformation tool. So I'm just gonna show you real quick how this works. Um, let me go to, let's find a point. Um, actually, oh, I know what I need to do. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. Let's find a point on campus um, and let's see if we can develop state plane coordinates for it. This is gonna be kind of rough, but we'll give it kind of an idea. So let's go to Marshall University. Let's go to maps. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go down to layers. I'm gonna turn my satellite layer on. And one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom down. Let's zoom down a little bit. Okay, so here's Buskirk Field. And let's see if I can find coordinates for that right there. So that is the, um, uh, that's I believe CP13. That's where, that's about where CP13 is. Again, I'm not getting perfect. But um, if you look what um, Google does, it will actually provide you lat long, latitude and longitude for that point. So I'm gonna copy that. Um, let, me, let me copy this. Let's copy this. And I'm just gonna put this in a, um, a little notepad right here. So just so I have that data. So this is the latitude and the longitude. The longitude is negative because we're west. So we're in, in the United States, we're so many west from the, um, uh, from Greenwich. So um, I'm going to go to my uh, NGS coordinate tool and I'm going to say here's latitude. So we'll put latitude here. Let's put longitude here. Okay. And you can see now we're, we're, ooh, let's, let's zoom in a little bit further. Let's see how we're doing. 
That's about right. That's pretty good. That's about where, where CP13 is. So you can see it's about where it is. Um, and so we'll hit submit. And what we can see is now we have um, a northing and an easting. And so uh, I'm not saying we would use these for lab or anything, um, but just to give you kind of an idea, this would be the northing and easting uh, coordinate about of CP13 uh, according to state plane coordinates. Now, um, one thing, uh, so, so you know, if we wanted to develop state plane coordinates for our control points, we could. We haven't been doing that in lab just honestly because um, it's just a little bit cumbersome to... Uh, uh, to enter these into the total station every time we do a traverse. Although for our topo, we might. We might go ahead and use um, state plane coordinates so that we can tie our topo map into state plane coordinates later. Uh, I actually haven't made a decision if we're going to do that yet or not, but we might. So, um, so okay. But that's kind of the idea uh, of how you do that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the U.S. Public Land Survey System. We don't really use this in West Virginia, but it's used pretty uh, commonly throughout the United States. Um, it was created, I mean, it's been around for a very long time. It was created by Thomas Jefferson uh, in the late 1700s. Um, you'll sometimes hear it called the system of rectangular surveys. And so the idea is that it would provide uh, a um, consistent uh, system for dividing and marking boundaries for when you have relatively, like, like really big pieces of land. Um, it was uh, intended to try and prevent a lot of the errors and confusion that you would have with descriptions in the colonies. So you'll find that the U.S. Uh, public land survey system is pretty much used for the most part everywhere that wasn't an original colony. Um, the idea is that you will, for, for a really large tract of land, it will be broken up first up into quadrangles. So a quadrangle is 24 miles by 24 miles, so a big tract of land that's 24 by 24. You'll take that and subdivide it into townships. Each of the townships are six miles by six miles, and then the townships are divided into 36 sections that are about uh, a mile by a mile. Um, and so here's a system. Uh, this is the uh, uh, sort of the map of, of sis rectangular systems in the United States. And everywhere that's a colored state, everywhere that's non uh, a not white state on this map, um, uh, it, it use the rectangular system uh, survey. So as you can see, the ones that don't are, for the most part, the uh, original colonies. And Texas, they, they don't use the rectangular system. But a, a large section of the, the United States does. Even Ohio, which is just right across, or, yeah, right across the river first. I'm pointing the wrong way. Eh. Um, and so the idea is that you'll have, you know, like a quadrangle. Again, the quadrangle, so for example, here we have... Um, Let's say, so for example, we have a quadrangle right here um, that's 24 miles by 24 miles. That'll be broken up into townships, and then those townships will be broken up into uh, mile by mile uh, tracks and whatnot. And so the idea behind it is that whenever you're referencing properties, let's say in deeds or whatnot, it it makes the the properties easier to reference, even in a much broader context. Um, so, for example, we can say that this property is in the southwest quarter of the northeast quarter of Section X of such and such township or, or what have you. And so the idea is that whenever you're referencing properties and legal descriptions, it removes a lot of the ambiguity. And again, it came as we were expanding the country and we're trying to avoid a lot of the confusion and property descriptions that we had in the original colonies, trying to resolve that with rectangular uh, 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 survey descriptions. So I just mentioned that in case you see the uh, descriptions from, you know, like Ohio or, or some other places. That's sort of where that's uh, where that's coming from. Okay, uh, and that, that concludes my lecture. Um, this is the first of our uh, mapping, uh, two mapping application lectures. The next is going to be the topo lecture, uh, the uh, lecture on topographic maps, um, which I'm going to do right before we begin our topo uh, lab because that's going to be a really big lab in the class and we want to make sure that that information is really fresh in everybody's head. Uh, but with that, that's all I have and I will see you in the next lecture.